July 1942, RAF Biggin Hill. Test pilots gathered around a Spitfire MiG-9 as its Merlin 61 engine roared to life with a sound they'd never heard before. The supercharger whine rose to an unprecedented pitch, and as the aircraft climbed, it kept climbing past 20,000 feet, past 25,000, reaching altitudes where the older Spitfire Mech V gasped for air like a drowning man. This wasn't just another engine modification. This was mathematics made manifest, fluid dynamics transformed into raw power. For nearly a year, the Luftwaffe's Focke-Wulf 190 had terrorized RAF pilots, outrunning, outclimbing, and outgunning every fighter Britain could field. Pilots returned shaken if they returned at all, reporting an enemy aircraft that seemed to break every rule. The RAF was losing air superiority over its own channel. But inside this new Merlin beat the redesign of a man the veteran engineers had dismissed as unqualified. Stanley Hooker, an Oxford mathematician with no practical experience, had done what seemed impossible. Using pure theory and an intuitive grasp of airflow that bordered on supernatural, he'd unlocked power output the traditional engineers never found. Not through brute force, through understanding what others had missed. The Crisis Point For two decades, Rolls-Royce had ruled British aviation like an unchallenged dynasty. Their engines powered the fighters that defended the realm, elegant liquid-cooled V-12 engines that represented the pinnacle of British engineering tradition. The mechanics who built them had learned their craft from men who'd worked alongside Henry Royce himself. They knew piston engines. They understood superchargers. They'd refined the Merlin through countless hours of testing, adjusting, perfecting. Then came August 1941, and everything changed. Pilots returning from combat over France spoke of a new German fighter that defied everything they knew. The Fock Wolf 190 could outrun the Spitfire, Mark 5 by 25 to 35 miles per hour. It climbed faster, rolled faster, accelerated harder. RAF pilots found themselves helpless, watching their adversaries engage at will and break away untouchable. Wing Commander Johnny Johnson described the humiliation. We could outturn it, but you couldn't turn all day. As the number of 1-9s increased, so the depth of our penetrations deceased, they drove us back to the coast. British air superiority, won at such cost during the Battle of Britain, was evaporating. The Luftwaffe needed only two fighter wings to dominate the entire Western Front. Each sortie over France became a deadly gamble. The question haunting every briefing room was simple and terrible. Could the RAF's fighters compete at all? The outsider arrives. January 1938. Stanley Hooker walked through a damp Derby morning toward the Rolls-Royce works, his heart sinking with every step. He was a doctor of philosophy from Oxford, specializing in fluid dynamics and aerodynamics. He had published papers on airflow theory that impressed academics, but he had never built an engine, never worked in a factory, never held a wrench in anger. The interview with Ernest Hives, the formidable production director, had been brief and unsettling. Hives thumbed through Hooker's academic papers, paused, leaned forward, and asked a technical question. When Hooker explained as best he could, Hives delivered his verdict. You're not much of an engineer, are you? Hooker had to agree. Hives smiled slightly. Never mind, this place is full of the best engineers in the world, and they will teach you. But when Hooker arrived for his first day, nobody taught him anything. He was shown to an eight-foot square office containing a desk, a chair, an empty bookcase, and a telephone. Nothing more. For days, he sat alone, reading the Times, listening to the hive of industry humming around him, wondering what he was supposed to do. Eventually, by a series of supposed coincidences likely orchestrated by Hives himself, Hooker drifted into the supercharger department. The Merlin relied on a supercharger to compress incoming air, allowing it to maintain power at altitude. The unit sat at the rear of the engine, driven by gears from the crankshaft, forcing air into the cylinders faster than atmospheric pressure alone could provide. When Hooker examined the installation with his trained eye for fluid behavior, he saw something the experienced engineers had missed. The supercharger intake was cramped, squashed, twisted to fit behind the engine. The airflow had to navigate sharp turns and restrictions before reaching the impeller. He calculated the losses and was shocked. The efficiency was barely 68%. Nearly a third of the supercharger's potential was being strangled by bad geometry. He wrote a report detailing his findings. Days passed. Then the chief supercharger engineer, Jimmy Ellor, burst into his office holding the document. Did you write this? He demanded. Hooker nervously admitted he had. Well done, jolly good stuff. From now on, you are in charge of supercharger development. The veteran mechanics watched this development with skepticism bordering on contempt. Who was this academic with his charts and calculations? What could theory possibly teach men who'd spent decades perfecting engines through hard-won experience? The Invisible Revolution. 
Hooker approached the problem through fluid dynamics. He couldn't see the air, but he could model it. At high velocities, air behaved like a temperamental fluid with eddies, vortices, pressure drops, and turbulence that destroyed efficiency. The original supercharger intake was a side entry design, forcing air through sharp 90 degree turns into six separate openings around the impeller. Every turn created resistance. Every junction spawned turbulence. By the time air reached the impeller blades, it had already lost pressure and velocity. Hooker redesigned everything. He created a central entry intake with smooth aerodynamic curves that directed all incoming air in the same direction. No sharp corners, no sudden transitions, just gentle, optimized geometry that let air flow like water down a perfectly shaped channel. He redesigned the impeller blades themselves, the diffuser that controlled outflow, even the gear ratios that drove the supercharger at different speeds. The improvements were invisible from outside. The engine looked identical, but when the new supercharger entered testing in 1940, efficiency jumped from 68% to 76%. Power output increased dramatically at the altitudes that mattered most for combat. The Merlin 45, incorporating Hooker's redesigned supercharger, entered service in October 1940 on the Spitfire Mark V. It arrived just in time for the closing stages of the Battle of Britain, giving RAF pilots altitude performance that extended their combat ceiling to 19,000 feet, 3,000 feet higher than before. But Hooker wasn't finished. When the Air Ministry requested a Merlin for high-altitude bomber operations, they suggested turbocharging, the American approach using exhaust-driven compressors. Hooker declined. Instead, he designed something unprecedented, a two-stage supercharger with two impellers in series on the same shaft, each boosting pressure in succession with an intercooler between stages to prevent the compressed air from overheating and losing density. His calculations showed it would deliver power at altitudes beyond 30,000 feet, but building it required precision engineering on a scale Rolls-Royce had never attempted. The Lancaster Rises. The Avro Lancaster heavy bomber needed four Merlin engines to lift its massive bomb load. With Hooker's improved Merlin XX engines, each producing over 1,200 horsepower, the Lancaster transformed from an underpowered concept into Britain's primary strategic weapon. The aircraft became legendary. 7,377 Lancasters rolled off production lines, each mounting four Merlins incorporating Hooker's supercharger improvements. The bomber could carry loads ranging from incendiary clusters to the massive 22,000-pound Grand Slam earthquake bomb, the largest conventional weapon of the war. Lancaster squadrons destroyed German dams during Operation Chastise, leveled industrial centers, and turned the strategic bombing campaign into a decisive force. The sound of Lancaster's departing for night missions became the sound of British defiance. Mechanics called the Merlin a gentleman's engine for its smooth power delivery and remarkable reliability. Pilots trusted it absolutely. In a four-engine bomber, losing one engine was survivable because the other three Merlins would bring you home. The Lancaster flew 156,000 sorties and dropped over 600,000 tons of bombs between 1942 and 1945. But the fighters still needed an answer to the FW-190, High Altitude Salvation. When the Focke Wolf 190 appeared, it exposed a fundamental limitation. The Merlin 45 single-stage supercharger maintained excellent power up to medium altitudes, but above 20,000 feet, performance dropped off dramatically. The FW-190's BMW radial engine gave German pilots the ability to climb higher, faster, and attack from above with impunity. RAF losses mounted through the winter of 1941 and into 1942. British fighter sweeps became exercises in survival rather than dominance. The Spitfire MK-5, only months earlier, the pride of Fighter Command had become obsolete. Hooker's two-stage Merlin 61 changed everything. The engine maintained over 1,600 horsepower at 20,000 feet and continued delivering useful power beyond 30,000 feet. The first Spitfire Mark IX with the two-stage Merlin flew in prototype form in 1941. By July 1942, production aircraft reached frontline squadrons. The reversal was immediate and dramatic. Spitfire Mickey 9 pilots found themselves able to outclimb the FW-190, match its speed at all altitudes, and crucially, sustain combat power in the thin air above 25,000 feet where the German fighter's performance fell away. The tactical advantage swung back to the RAF. German pilots who'd grown accustomed to superiority suddenly faced an opponent that could match them in every performance metric except roll rate. By September 1942, the balance had shifted decisively. The FW-190 remained formidable, but it no longer dominated. British fighters could engage on equal terms. 
Over the next two years, continuous refinements kept Spitfire variants competitive against every fighter Germany could field. American Power, the Packard Motor Company, contracted to mass-produce Merlins in America, built over 50,000 engines based on Hooker's designs. The Packard 51650, incorporating the two-stage supercharger architecture Hooker pioneered, transformed the North American P-51 Mustang from a mediocre mid-altitude fighter into the war's premier long-range escort fighter. The Mustang's achievement was unprecedented, with Packard Merlins providing over 1,400 horsepower and the aircraft's efficient airframe sipping fuel slowly, P-51s could escort American bomber formations all the way from England to Berlin and back. The strategic bombing campaign that broke Germany's war production relied absolutely on that capability. Canadian-built Lancasters used Packard Merlin engines, British Mosquito Light Bombers, de Havilland's Wooden Wonder, mounted paired Merlins for speeds exceeding 400 miles per hour. Hawker Hurricanes flew through the entire war with successive Merlin upgrades. The Curtis P-40 fighter gained significant performance from Merlin installations. By 1944, every major Allied Air Force operated aircraft powered by engines incorporating Hooker's breakthroughs, beyond pistons. But even as Merlin-powered aircraft dominated the skies of 1944, the future was already visible. In 1940, Hooker met Frank Whittle, the brilliant inventor struggling to produce his revolutionary jet engine. Whittle had the concept, but Rover, the company contracted to build production engines, couldn't deliver. Parts arrived late to wrong specifications, or not at all. Hooker brought Ernest Hives to visit Whittle. The meeting in a pub between Hives and Rover's Morris Wilkes produced a legendary deal. Rover would take Rolls-Royce's tank engine factory. Rolls-Royce would take the jet engine project. The swap happened overnight. Hooker immediately threw Rolls-Royce's manufacturing expertise into producing components for Whittle's designs. The collaboration launched Britain into the jet age. Rolls-Royce jet engines powered the Gloucester Meteor, Britain's first operational jet fighter. Hooker's expertise in fluid dynamics, honed on superchargers, translated perfectly to compressor design for turbojets. The principles were identical, just operating at higher speeds and temperatures. By 1945, piston engines had reached their zenith. The Merlin, in its final forms, produced over 2,000 horsepower through improved fuel and higher boost pressures. But the fundamental architecture had reached its limit. The future belonged to jets, and Hooker would define that future too. The Mathematician's Legacy after the war, Hooker left Rolls-Royce for Bristol Aero Engines, where he designed the Olympus turbojet for the Avro Vulcan bomber and later Concorde. He created the Pegasus vectored thrust turbofan that powered the Harrier jump jet. When Rolls-Royce faced bankruptcy in 1971 from the troubled RB211 project, the company brought Hooker out of retirement at age 64 to rescue the program. He succeeded, saving Britain's jet engine industry. Today's Rolls-Royce Trent engines, powering Boeing 787s and Airbus A380 worldwide, trace their lineage directly to Hooker's RB211 rescue. The company he joined as an uncertain scholar became, and remains, the world's second largest aircraft engine manufacturer. Hooker never forgot where he started. In 1984, weeks before his death, he published his autobiography. The title captured everything about his improbable journey, not much of an engineer. The quip Hives made at his interview became Hooker's gentle reminder that genius comes in unexpected forms. Test pilot Bill Bedford, who flew the Harrier and countless other aircraft powered by Hooker's engines, delivered the ultimate tribute. If I was asked who was Britain's greatest ever engineer, I'd have to decide between Brunel and Sir Stanley Hooker, but I'd probably go for Sir Stanley. The question that changed history. The Merlin produced over 160,000 engines during World War II, more than any other Allied aircraft engine except the Soviet Shvetsov radial. It powered approximately 40 different aircraft types in combat roles. The vast majority of Lancaster production, 7,000 bombers requiring four engines each, consumed nearly 30,000 Merlins. Spitfires used 20,000 more. The numbers represent more than manufacturing achievement. They represent survival. What if Ernest Hives had dismissed the awkward scholar in 1938? What if Rolls-Royce had continued refining the original supercharger design through incremental improvements, the way established engineering wisdom suggested? The performance gains Hooker achieved through theoretical analysis of airflow might never have materialized. The RAF might have faced the FW190 without an answer. The Lancaster might have remained underpowered. The Mustang might never have escorted bombers to Berlin. One man doubted for his lack of practical experience proved that theory could outperform tradition that understanding invisible physics mattered more than decades of empirical testing, that sometimes the outsider sees what the experts cannot. Would you trust your nation's survival to someone with no engineering experience? 
Britain did, and Stanley Hooker repaid that trust by helping win the war in the air. The Merlin's legacy extends beyond military history into aviation culture itself. The sound of a Merlin at full power remains instantly recognizable, a distinctive supercharger wind building into a thunderous roar that represents technological excellence and human courage. Warbird enthusiasts speak of Merlins with reverence. Only two airworthy Lancasters survive, flying at air shows where crowds gather to hear those four Merlins sing their deep-throated song. At the Battle of Britain, Memorial Flight in England, and the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum, maintaining Merlins remains a specialized art practiced by engineers who've studied the original factory manuals. Every time a Spitfire or Lancaster takes flight, Stanley Hooker's innovations live again in the supercharger pressurizing air, boosting power, making the impossible routine. Those changes to intake geometry, those optimized impeller curves, that central entry design nobody could see from outside. Those theoretical improvements turned Britain's fighter defense from desperate to dominant and its heavy bombers from adequate to devastating. Theory, it turns out, can be the most practical thing in the world when survival demands it.